Hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. In previous videos, we talked about mapping simple genetic traits. Those are traits whose variation is caused by alleles at a single gene. In the last set of videos, we talked about how most traits are not simple and various complications associated with genetic mapping. In this set of videos, we'll look at how we actually map complex traits. In this first video, we'll look at some of the principles used in mapping such complex traits. So let's get started. Now, as I mentioned before, most variable traits that people study tend to be controlled by many, many genes, not one gene. There is not a single cancer gene. There is not a single diabetes gene. But in fact, there are many genes that contribute to the likelihood you could get something like cancer, diabetes, schizophrenia, etc. Now, a couple of other traits that people have studied extensively are fruit size. This is actually one of the first traits, fruit size in tomatoes, one of the first traits that was uh, nailed down to a single gene's effect. Now, there are many genes that contribute to it, but one of the genes was actually identified. Human height is definitely one that would be controlled by many genes. And a funny one that a lot of geneticists study is bristle number in Drosophila. So on the back of a fruit fly, you have all these little hairs. These are their bristles. And something a lot of people try to map as a nice quantitative sort of trait, where there's a lot of variation among individuals, are the number of bristles on the backs of flies. But obviously, a major focus, especially coming from the Human Genome Project, was understanding the genetic basis of disease. Now, in the last video, I used this fictional simplified example of six genes contributing to human height. And as you saw, each of these genes is contributing an effect, the A gene, B gene, C gene, D gene, etc. These are all contributing to this variation, and yet we see this bell curve, this normal distribution of height. So how do we go about mapping all these different genes? There, again, there's not one height gene, there's a lot of different genes. Well, the concepts for doing this are very simple for the mapping simple single gene traits. Okay? Nonetheless, as I mentioned, there are many genes contributing. Well, again, just like before, there's two general approaches. And we'll come back to these in subsequent videos. I want to emphasize in this video just some of the overlying principles. One of them is mapping the difference using crosses or pedigrees. And this is exactly what we do with the simple traits. The other one is mapping variation within populations. And we'll talk about the genome-wide association study, often abbreviated as GWAS. I'd like to emphasize a few points before we get started. First, we often know the locations of the markers being used ahead of time. So if we're using something like, say, mapping in humans, we have a fully assembled human genome sequence. We have sites that we know are variable, these so-called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. These have been identified from genome sequences. So we know where the markers are. However, we don't know the locations of the genes causing traits or diseases ahead of time. Okay, so we know where the markers are, but we don't know where the genes contributing to cancer are. We know there are genes that are contributing to cancer, but we haven't identified them ahead of time. The purpose of mapping is to find where they are relative to markers. So we're using their linkage to the markers to find these genes that are causing traits or diseases, to identify where in this vast genome sequence they are. Okay? Now, we map complex traits to things we call QTLs. That's short for quantitative trait locus, or if plural, quantitative trait loci. Now, these are places in the genome, or locus, with allelic variation that influence a phenotype. Now again, ahead of time, we don't know where these QTLs are. These QTLs are things that we infer from the data, from the mapping data. And, in, and at some level, you can think of them as almost a hypothesis, that we are inferring it's here, but it may not actually be right there. And we'll come back to this a little bit later on, how something that we map as a QTL may not actually be the location of the gene causing the trait. But nonetheless, we infer the approximate location from the association with marker genotypes. Now, very often, we detect many QTLs affecting single traits, so something like height, for example. But just as before, the fundamental underlying principle is we're looking for an association of marker genotype with phenotype. Okay? We're looking for that. And the reason for this is that markers that are near or linked to the genes causing different phenotypes should show some association with the phenotype. And I'll show you what I mean by this in just a moment. Now, if there are many genes, or if the effect is complicated, this association may not be very strong. So this isn't going to be as precise and as clear-cut as it was before, where we could say, oh, it's, it's one centimorgan or 1% recombination away from this. This is going to be far less precise. But it's nonetheless 
possible to localize the location of these QTLs and therefore the genes affecting traits. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine you're crossing some corn strains. So let's say you have some tall corn, which let's say is five feet tall, and some short corn, which we'll say is one foot tall. That would be anomalously short corn, but let's pretend that's okay. Now let's say the F1s, the offspring, are intermediate, so they're three feet on average. And you know, they're pretty consistent about being three feet tall. Now we cross the F1s together to get an F2, and F2 is just a cross from F1, as the offspring from a pair of F1s. And let's say the F1s show this range from one feet to five feet, so they recapitulate the range seen in the parents. So we get something like a bell curve around three feet, something like this. Or here's one foot, here's five feet. We get a lot of three feet ones, some four feet ones, some two feet ones. Okay. Now, assuming the hypervariation is genetic, how many genes are involved? Is this likely to be something that is a single gene effect? The answer is really unlikely, right? There would have to be a lot of different alleles there doing this. So probably not. It's, pro it's much more likely to be something that's caused by many genes. Nonetheless, we know that this height difference is at least partially genetic. So there are genes affecting height. Okay. So let's say we got a genotype for two markers in the process of mapping this height difference among the corns. And let's say the capital letter ones are, are the ones from tall as we use them here, A and Z. So let's say we look for an association between genotype and average phenotype that's associated, that comes with that genotype. So here, individ individuals with markers, homozygous for the big A marker are three and a half feet tall. Individuals that are heterozygous for big A and little a, three feet tall. And little a, little a's are two and a half feet tall. Okay. Contrast, look at the Z marker. Big Z, big Z is three feet tall on average. Big Z, little Z is three feet tall. Little Z, little Z is three feet tall. Now I'm saying this, I don't mean every single individual that's big Z, big Z, big Z, little Z, and little Z, little Z is three feet tall. But the average among individuals with that genotype at that marker is three feet tall. So is either marker associated with the phenotype? Do we see genotypes at these markers differentiating the phenotype? Well, obviously the answer is yes. In this particular example, Z is not associated with the phenotype, right? Because we don't see any difference among these genotypes in terms of the phenotype. But here, we do see a difference among the genotypes with the phenotype. Now, let me ask you a different question. Why wasn't the association of the alleles with the A marker much more complete? Why, it wasn't, why weren't big A, big A individuals five feet tall and little A, little A individuals one foot tall? that's what we saw with the parentals. Why didn't we see that? Well, the answer is all the things we talked about last time and one. So there's the possibility that there's multiple genes affecting the phenotype. This one's very likely to be true. It's possible that there's interactions among the genes or epistasis, right? All the things we talked about last time, all these complications, but an additional one that I want to factor in here, and this is the essence of genetic mapping, is that there's been recombination between the marker genes basically the, these, these A and Z genes, and the genes affecting the phenotype, so an actual gene affecting height. But there's some recombination between those two. And what happens then is this recombination between the marker and the genes affecting the phenotype weaken the association. If you had no recombination at all between the marker and the trait gene, then the marker genotype should very well predict the phenotype. Okay? This is especially true if it was a single gene trait, but this is somewhat true even if it's a trait with many genes. If you have a little bit of recombination, you weaken that association. It still may have some association, but it's weaker. And if there's lots of recombination, then there's no association. Again, this is the fundamental underlying principle of all genetic mapping. Now, let me ask you this question. How do we pinpoint gene locations in, in the middle of all this madness? Right? Well, at a very crude level, very, very crude level, we can just look for associations between uh, marker alleles to phenotype, and we can say that there is a gene near there affecting that trait. That's not particularly satisfying. That would be like, you know, you're trying to find somebody who's missing, and you pinpoint them like this. They are in this area of the state of North Carolina. Well, that's not very helpful. <laughs> what we really want is fine localization. In this case, we want to be able to point at a particular spot in the genome, or using this uh, example, a spot on a map, and say the person is in this building here. So what we want to do to do this is we want to look at increasing association of neighboring markers. We're going to look at a trajectory of association. We'll look at markers in a sequence, and as we get closer and closer to the gene with variation affecting the trait with these different markers, we should see stronger and stronger associations. Okay.
Now, fine localization, as I mentioned, requires examining associations of multiple linked markers with the trait. Not completely linked, but markers that are very close together. And we'll look for a stronger association in some markers than others. Now, you may be asking yourself, what do I mean by a stronger association? Well, a stronger association means there's a bigger difference between the average phenotypes associated with the genotypes. So remember, the Z marker I drew out before had no association. I'll actually draw that on here just as an illustration here. So the, oops, the Z marker at three feet, three feet, three feet. This had no association whatsoever with the, um, with the trait of interest, in this case being height of corn. We'll look at the A1, and here's, we do see this difference. This is the one we saw before. Here's a B1. Well, if you look at this B1, there's actually a bigger difference between the average phenotype associated with the genotype. So let's assume that A and B are near each other. That well, let's say here's here's A, here's B, and let's say Z is very far away. Okay. If we see this, we say okay, A has a weak association, B has a stronger association, right? Because we see this bigger average difference. We might infer that the that the gene causing this difference in height is probably closer to B than it is to A. Okay, so essentially we, we want to focus in near this marker, near this marker B. Now again, association will be stronger if there's less recombination between a marker and the causative gene or the QTL. So from this, we generate a prediction that if we look at many linked markers, we should be able to pinpoint the location of the QTL by where the association is strongest or where we predict it to be strongest. Like we'll, we'll infer a continuing association going further along there. So to do this, we'll follow the trajectory of association strength to infer exactly where this QTL will be. Now we'll do this in the very next video. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this was helpful.